I'm Melvin Davis, and I'm chairing today's session. And I'm very pleased to introduce Steve Longmore, who is an astronomer, in fact, from Liverpool John Moores, who's been visiting us this week. And it's really interesting to see, I think, how one area of research can have impacts and do interesting things in other areas. And we're going to hear today about that with astroecology, astrophysics meets conservation biology. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, fantastic to be here. And thanks to Melvin for uh, such a warm welcome. Um, right, so I'm going to tell you about a rather uh, crazy uh, idea that we had a few years ago, myself and uh, an ecologist, Serge Vick. And this crazy idea was, could we use astrophysics to try and help ecologists? So this crazy idea, it's either um, we've managed to convince a whole bunch of other people that it's crazy, or it's less crazy than we originally thought. So we were lucky enough to now be working with um, quite a few other staff at Liverpool John Moores University and the University of Liverpool, uh, some PhD students, master's students, and summer students, and uh, quite a few postdocs working on this project now. So I'm going to try and show you today really the, uh, give an, an overview of all this work that's been done by uh, a large number of people. Uh, and uh, finally, sort of, we've now gone beyond just working in the university and we've got a, a whole bunch of uh, international collaborators that we're working with around the world to try and implement what we've been developing. So here's the outline of my talk. So I'd like to start by really framing the challenge that we're trying to tackle with this uh, combination of astrophysics and ecology. And then to put things in perspective, I'll, I'll give a bit of background on the project and a bit about the timeline to show you how we've come to be where we are at the present day. But the thing I really want to spend most time on is our long-term goals and our progress towards that. Because I think that's where we'll probably be of most interest and where there's overlap with what we're doing. And hopefully, you know, there's, there's some potential crossover with what other people are doing and we can sort of build on, on that and, and help each other there. And then at the end, sort of time for questions. Okay, so what is the challenge we're trying to address? Well, what we're trying to do is to help animals like these. So these are uh, sort of things that you may well be familiar with. The problem is that we are too late. These are the years in which these animals became extinct. If we could start this project a few years ago, we may be able to help them. Now, that's tragic for these animals, but it's not in isolation. The astonishing fact that gets me out of bed in the morning to work on this by the end of today, by the time you get into bed, five species of life on the planet will become extinct. Gone forever. It's an absolutely astonishing rate of decline. Not only that, but there are half as many wild animals out there than there were several decades ago. Now, what this means in terms of, so the, the, in planetary history, is that we're now in a mass extinction event that hasn't been seen since the dinosaurs. Okay, so this is, this is a, a serious problem. And it's not just the, the, the cute, fluffy little animals that, that we're worried about. It affects, um, biodiversity loss affects us too. It's a massive threat to humanity because ecosystems provide $33 trillion a year to the world economy. That's more than the GDP of the USA and Europe combined every year. And the fact that we're wiping out these ecosystems means that uh, the, the World um, Economic Forum put ecosystem collapse as one of the top 10 threats to humanity in the 21st century. So not just cute fluffy things, it's important for us too. This is a problem that we have to, to get on top of. Um, and of course, not all countries are affected equally. The ones that are affected worse are the, are the, are the, the poorest because they tend to have the economies that most rely on having healthy ecosystems. For example, ecotourism in Africa, in one country alone, is 40, million, 40 billion. Uh, so ecotourism in the whole of Africa is 40 billion uh, pounds per year. Um, and it's the megafauna of these big animals. They're crucial in, in ecosystem, uh, the, in, in regulating at the top of the, the, the food chain, eating all the grass and things. And, and they, it's about 25 million pounds per year per species per country. So that's just to put it in real numbers for... for uh, okay, so what do we want to do? That's all, the, that's all the doom and gloom. I promise that's the last doom and gloom. Now what are we going to do about it? Let's be positive. So there are two things that we need to do to overcome this. Number one is we need to monitor the wildlife. If we don't know where the animals are, we can't tell if, they're, if their numbers are dropping and we don't know where to protect them. There's only so much resources we can put in to try and help things. We need to know what's dropping and where. And we need to stop poaching. So they're the two fundamental things that we're going to try and overcome. We're going to try and use astrophysics in order to do that. So how can we do that? Well, this is where I sort of came into the project. 
So the, the issue is, so people are working incredibly hard to try and tackle this problem. So this, this is, it's been known for a long time, there's been lots of dedicated, passionate people. But the problem is that the way that traditional counting has been done is too inefficient. So to give you an example, the way you count orangutan in, uh, in Borneo is that you walk a, a line transect, so you walk for several kilometers through very thick jungle, and of course, all the animals just scarper, they disappear. So what you have to do is you have indirect methods. You either count their nests and try and infer numbers of animals from that, or for, if you're looking for elephants, you can count dung. But these are very indirect methods, and they're extremely time inefficient. Imagine it takes one person how long to walk two kilometers through a jungle, and you've got to survey something the size of Austria. Okay, this is not an efficient way to do things. So, drones to the rescue. <laughs> this is where I start to be able to help because drones are revolutionizing many things, um, not least of which is uh, biodiversity. If you can take a drone and fly over an area, you can cover huge areas very quickly. Okay, so this is really making a difference in many areas and, and also in, in ecology. But the problem, then you come up with another problem. And the problem is, so, the, so this is kind of the challenge of current efforts. Number one, with, if you're using optical uh, cameras, you can only see in the daytime, right? So you're looking at reflected light from the sun, you only see in the daytime, and most, a lot of animals are active at night, certainly poachers are active at night, so you're blind half the time. The other thing is, animal, well, yeah, all objects are equally bright, and animals have been evolving happily over millions of years to be camouflaged and blend into the background. They don't want to stand out, particularly if they're, if they're predated on. Um, so what this means is, if you fly over for an hour, you, how many independent frames you've got, if you're taking frames at 60 hertz and you fly for an hour, that's a heck of a lot of frames. So instead of walking through a forest, we've now got people sitting in front of computers, frame by frame, trying to put boxes around things, which is equally time intensive, better, but um, it's completely unfeasible as a global prob uh, solution to this problem. So, right, this is where astrophysics comes in. Because what we've been trying to do is instead of using optical wavelengths is to use thermal wavelengths. So in thermals at about 10 microns, uh, our body temperature, the, the typical um, temperature is we're, because we're warmer than, than the background, we glow. Things glow in the thermal infrared and that means that objects stand out against the background. So I don't know if you've ever seen these, you know, the, the shows on TV where you've got a police helicopter chasing the bad guy and the, and the bad guy hides in a bush and he thinks he's safe but they've got a thermal camera and they can pick, pick out the bad guys. So it's the same technology, but we're using it to find and count animals. Okay, the important thing economically is cameras, these thermal cameras that were prohibitively expensive are now cheap enough that you can begin to buy them and they're small enough you can put them on drones. Okay, so astronomy. Again, what's always got to do with astronomy? And it turns out that astronomers, um, we've got several decades of using thermal cameras. So we've been developing them, using them to study things like how the first galaxies and stars formed uh, and so on. And so this is a, a, a Hubble telescope image, the deepest ever uh, image taken of staring at one blank piece of sky for 21 days. And all these are sort of very young galaxies when the universe was very young. And so what we want to do, can we use these techniques to help conservation? So what we can do in astronomy is we, we find these things, we characterize them, we, we learn something about the physics of the universe evolving. Can we do the same thing with a rhino nebula? That is the basic premise of what we're trying to do. Okay, so a quick potted history. So that's what we want to, to, to tackle. And we're going to give a brief history of where we are now and then spend the rest of the time thinking of the, sort of the, the things we're developing. All right, so this is myself and this is uh, Serge Vic. It turns out that we're actually, we're next to the whole thing started because we're next door neighbors. Uh, so we're literally chatting over the garden fence and that's how this thing started. So that was back in 2014. And then we managed to, I went to my head of department and said, I've um, got this crazy idea, can we buy a drone and a thermal camera? And amazingly he said yes. And so he bought, this is a drone and a thermal camera on top of that. And this is a field near where, near where we live. And we've got a kind farmer um, who let us fly the drone in his field to see if this idea was completely bonkers or if there was some, uh, some idea behind it. Then we managed to convince two very good um, summer uh, students at the university, summer students, to uh, join us on this project and go and fly drones over cows. Uh, not a typical thing an astrophysics student does. But um, anyway, they were brave enough to do it. And so here we go. So this is us, the first ever takeoff. 
That's Surge, that's the two summer students. That's the drone. Uh, by the way, I'm not allowed anywhere near the drones. I can, I'm not allowed to fly them. Um, I can tell you why later. Um, <laughs> and this was the very first thing. So this is now a thermal image. What you're looking at here, white is hot, black is cold. So this is a heat map that you're seeing from the drone as it's flying. And you can see the two students here waving around pretending to be poachers. And what we've done is we've taken very simple astronomy detection algorithms and very basic machine learning and said, can we pick out these the, the people? Now you can see it's not perfect. I mean, this thing's going crazy over here. And this is our first attempt. It's a bit embarrassing to look back on now because things are a lot more sophisticated. But in principle, it worked. So that was, that was cool. And it turned out that in the next field over, there were a bunch of cows. And we thought, well, let's fly over the cows. Um, they didn't seem to mind. And it works on them too. So it works on humans and animals. Hey, this idea might have legs. OK, so that was back in 2015. Um, so then we decided to get serious with this. Can we, what do we need to really try and make an impact in these big problems? And so we were lucky. We even had a lot of support from university. We had a, um, some, we got one competition to enable us to hire a postdoc and to buy uh, a new camera that was a thermal and optical at the same time. That will become important later on. And then we started working with people around us. So this is with WWF and we went to Sepalok to go and look for orangutan. Uh, we had a fantastic PhD student join the project, uh, funded from, from the university, and uh, a postdoc with astrophysics and climate. She worked for the, the Met Office. Uh, in, which becomes important later, because the, the things like ground temperature are important, so her skills have been very important. Okay, so then, does this work on endangered animals? So we've, it works in a farmer's field, but does it work on real animals? And so we've been lucky enough to work with um, a couple of institutes near us. So there's a safari park, Nosley Safari, and Chester Zoo, and we've basically uh, gone to them and said, please, 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 can we fly our drone uh, over your animals? And they said yes and no. Uh, uh, but it's been incredibly important because what it's enabled us to do is to see different animals in different environments and pick out their thermal signature. Now it turns out that just like we've got, you know, fingerprints are all unique, animals, thermal, uh, the, the, the way that the temperature is distributed out the body is unique for different animals. That's cool because that means we can, we get the, for machine learning, we can use that different thermal signature to pick out a rhino from a hippo, whatever. Okay, so... Then we begin flying over animal enclosures. So at the top, we're seeing here is a rhino in the rhino enclosure. And you can see we're picking them out with our automated thing here. This is a troop of uh, baboons, I think. And you can tell, so for example, here, this is the male, the alpha male. You can see he's got a very, I remember white's hot and black's cold. He has very distinctive areas of heat, I shall say, to... Uh... <coughs> so but that's the sort of thing we're looking for. Right, is that makes it very distinctive. And then so we can tell a male from a, from a female from a, from a small one based on the size. And we can begin, so what, what the ecologists need are demographics. You know, how many males are there? If there's no males, you're probably not going to have a, a, a successful population in a few years' time. So that's the, the kind of thing that's of interest. So we begin building up thermal. This is now a heat map, uh, so white's hot, of different animals to begin building. Eventually, we get into machine learning that we can distinguish between these, all these animals. <clears throat> so we did this, we got, we got ourselves excited, we published a, a paper, and the good thing for us was that, that the media really jumped on this, which was fantastic, an astronomer and ecologist. Um, and that was really useful because it really, we, we, got, we got lots of interest from external people around the world. And that's been really important to kind of a, a proof of concept we can work in the wild. And so then we, the next step, so this was kind of mid-216, is to take this into the field. So we've been now working sort of all around the world with different, um, different organisations. And so the first thing we want to do, the, the real thing that I think we can make the most immediate impact is in poaching. Okay, so there are so few, for example, rhinos. There's so few rhinos left The we know it's, because there's so few, I mean, that's a horrible thing, but it's a good thing because it means that we can potentially have a, have a big impact. So the, so the first thing was, can we detect poachers in the field? So these are, uh, you see we've got lots of good students. These are students on our drone technology program that go every year to Tanzania. So they build a drone, they go there, they, they fly uh, they fly it. So we've got a field site, um, Alex Peel is a field site in, in um, uh, Tanzania. And so we hid them in the jungle in very bright t-shirts, pretending to be poachers, 
And so you notice this is wooded. And we, we see, could we detect them in an optical camera and a thermal camera? So that's, that's them hiding in, the, in the, the, uh, this Miombo woodland. And this is what you see from uh, the optical camera. Can anyone spot the, any students? Anyone? Right, well, there's one. <laughs> Boom, there they are in the thermal. Okay, if you've got a whole host of poachers out there, so this is now the camera flying over, all those hot spots you're seeing there are the students hiding that you don't see in the optical, but they come out really bright in there. So if you've got humans hiding, you tell your rangers, boom, you've, you, you go and get them and you try and save your, your rhino. So this seems uh, promising again. And uh, so we're building this library of, of human thermal fingerprints. We've been very well supported by the, the UK government. So the um, Science and Technology Facilities Council, STFC, we recently hired two uh, very good postdocs. Well, so Ross, who's an expert in machine learning, and Josh, who's machine learning and developing uh, systems. So he's uh, got the working on an, an automated drone, basically, that will do all this. OK, so then our next thing was animals. Can we try and save an animal? And at this stage, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed because we then went to South Africa. And uh, working with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, so this is one of the organisations that got in, trust, uh, in touch with us, the Endangered Wildlife Trust. So they, they were sort of one of the, the, the premium, um, the sort of leading conservation agencies in, in, in Southern Africa. And they were after something which I'd, I'd never heard of, I'm embarrassed to say, something called the riverine rabbit, which is the most endangered thing you've never heard of. <laughs> um, so this is, these are the species they're after. So this is unfortunately something that's already uh, no longer with us. This animal, just to give you an idea, so we were looking for this riverine rabbit, and there's estimated to be a few hundred of them in an area the size of Austria. Okay, so that's the challenge we're facing here. And they're small, they hide under bushes. Uh, looking back, it was probably the craziest thing we could possibly start started with. But he, well, we, we, they were interested, we thought, let's, let's go and give it a try. And so they've been, there's been a, a few hundred sightings. So people have been looking for them since, like, for, for decades. And there's been a few hundred sightings in total since, I don't know, the 60s or 70s. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but something like that. And so we went looking to find these things. And after a week, this is a drone flying with a bunch of people to try and flip, to flush them out. And there it is. That's the first ever thermal detection of a riverine rabbit. And, uh, yeah. We were rather excited about that. And um, yeah, so that's, that was fantastic. So it took a week. So we learned a heck of a lot on this. So we, we were originally flying, pointing the camera down. But it turns out that was rubbish because they were hiding underneath. So we had to put the camera at an angle. So it's all these sorts of things that you don't think of until you go in the field. That, that, um, so we're now working with the Endangered Wildlife Trust to see if we can do this systematically and, and help them counting. OK, so this is actually where Melvin comes in because we then at EWAS, the European Week of Astronomy and Space Science, earlier this year in April, we had uh, uh, we published a paper and had another press release. And I met Melvin, uh, who invited me here. So it's all, all connected. And then they really jumped on this. So this kind of went, uh, really got, got picked up everywhere, which has, again, been great for getting uh, involved in more places, which I'll show, which I'll show later. So the next thing that, that we've, we've, we've been working with, we've been working very closely with the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, so they have been, they've been interested in this thermal technology for, uh, for a while, because they, they, they run projects all over the world, as you can imagine. Um, so they wanted us to, to try and use this technology. And so we, just to show you how crazy, so we went for, the sm for a very small thing hiding under a bush in a hot place to try and find hot things in a jungle. Um, which, so as we're looking for things that are hotter than their surrounding, going somewhere that's hot and humid is not a good idea. Uh, but, well, we're obviously crazy. So we went there. So this in, uh, earlier this year, we went to, um, to Borneo to try and help find orangutan. So orangutan are uh, critically endangered. Um, and so we went to try and see if we could help them. Yeah, so we, this is us there. So this is the jungle. Here's a, an optical picture. This is us taking off from a drone. You can see the jungle. Imagine trying to walk through that and count out nests. There's leeches everywhere. Um, yeah, it's not the sort of thing you encounter as an astrophysicist much, but um, yeah. So we went in. I'm afraid I can't show you anything. Um, but if you if you can wait till spring 19, there's a we had a, a BBC 
uh, film crew with us. We're not allowed to show images, but um, I can say we've got the first. It works. <laughs> it works really well. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you to keep an eye out for this, this uh, BBC programme. We've, we've got movies that, that show things, but uh, it's because it's being, being filmed. I, I can show you stuff after, but not. <laughs> <laughs> and so similarly, with, uh, there's a project for spider monkeys in uh, Mexico. Similarly, that's National Geographic. I'm not going to show you that either, but come and see me afterwards and we'll. Um, okay. So hopefully, that's given you a bit of a background in the projects where we've come to so far. And what we really want to do, we've got two goals. <coughs> Our long-term goals are the following. Number one is that we're now, we've got funding, we want to make a fully automated uh, thermal drone system that we can give to someone who doesn't necessarily have a, a strong technical background, might not have much, much uh, formal schooling. Uh, so, and they can fly the drone. It will go fly over an area. It will identify, it will pick out targets of interest. It will tell you what it is, and it will send a little ping, a little cutout picture back to the person on the ground who can then uh, make a decision on based on that. You know, if it's a human, do we need to react? Do we need to send in forces? And that's kind of beyond. We, we tell them what's there and what it isn't, and they, they deal with it. That's not our expertise. So that's the, the first thing. So that's really for, for develop for time critical things like poaching. And then the other thing we're doing is to develop a, a web based system. So there's only so many of them, even though it's fantastic that the group has grown a lot and, and we've got a lot of people working on this, which is great. But there's no way we can possibly go all around the world everywhere and help every animal. That's just completely unfeasible. But there are a lot of people who are doing that. There's lots of agencies everywhere. So our next thing that we're doing is we're developing a web-based system that say that you want to fly your thermal drone to detect something and we're not there. You can upload that thermal data to our site and we'll have got all the... The, the machine learning, the uh, identification things in there, and it'll save you having to sit through and go through 100,000 frames and manually label things. And we'll spit you back how many rhinos there were, geolocation, so on and so forth. So this potentially has more impact in the longer term because it can affect larger things. Okay, so I'd like to spend the rest of the talk giving you some flavor for our progress towards those goals and this is hopefully where um, I'd love to hear from you if you've got ideas on this we're very open to people uh, working with us and, and exchanging of something we've developed that might be useful for you please uh, just get in touch right so here's a complicated plot this is just to say that we're working on lots of things this is our end goal what we want to hear so there's uh, this is the the end-to-end -end system so we have our drone our camera and some aerial coverage, you take some video, you use some detection software, you pick out objects of interest, you use your machine learning algorithm to tell you what it is, you confirm that, and then you give to ecologists um, scientifically meaningful data. So these are things, you know, you need to know the number of animal X per square blah as a function of time. Basically, that's the kind of the scientifically useful information that they need to then make decisions for how to use their resources to help said animal. Okay, so we're trying, to, and the point of this is that there's lots of different things that we're trying to do to help, uh, and I'm going to go through, and they sort of fit in this diagram, uh, don't pay too much attention to this, because what, what I'm really, I think is of more interest is, and I hate having so much text on the slide, I apologise, but I thought this would be a good way just to, if someone I wants to just have a quick reminder of what we're doing, it's all in one place. Um, I, I try not to have so much text on. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through each of these things uh, and, and tell you what we've been doing on those more in, in a sort of top-level sense. I, I, I don't think, there's many people who are not interested in that. So rather than going into a lot of detail on each of them, I'll try and give a top-level what we're doing. Uh, and then if you're interested, you can, you can chat to me about it. Okay, so the first thing we're doing is, this is work. Oh, no, I, sh I should say, so the people in brackets here are the, the people who are really leading this. So PhD student Maisie, uh, Rashman is working on thermal camera development. So we've been using off-the-shelf thermal cameras, and these are radiometric. So that means that, in principle, they can, they've got an absolute flux measurement that can tell you the temperature that you're looking at. So and they work in principle and practice, but the, uh, we found when we tried to do this that they, there are issues with stability I'm not sure how much we trust the absolute temperature measurements and so on. So we're, we're working, at, and in astronomy and astrophysics, we've got experience. So Ian Steele here 
is the director of the Liverpool Telescope. We, we have a telescope that we run on La Palma. And so we have an instrumentation group who understand. I, again, I'm not an instrumentation person, but these guys know what they're, they're doing. So they're taking these cameras, using the software we developed for astronomy to help improve stability, noise characteristics, absolute temperature, calibration, and so on. So here's just an example. The, the, these are the sorts of things we're using. This is a thing you can probably hold in, in your hand. Uh, these two objects here, these are thermal camera, and this is that camera that's got a thermal and an RGB, the same again. You can hold them in your hand, they fit under a drone and fly easily. Just some tech specs if anyone's interested. Okay, so what we have is, this is, a, this is our opt optics bench, ha ha. Uh, this is how, yeah, so for, for that's funny because this is like so, so, so rubbish you wouldn't usually show this, but this is just to show when we, we've now actually got a proper optics bench, but this is how we started was with a table, cameras um, and various bits of kit we borrowed from our uh, instrumentation colleagues. So this is my thanks to our instrumentation colleagues. They've been a lot of help in this. And, and then we bought sort of a thermal black body source that you could put to a very precise temperature and then we can test these cameras. And this is work that Maisie, so I think that's Maisie there, uh, been doing. And so the sorts of things we've been doing is looking how reliable the temperatures, what size of animal in terms of number of pixels do you need to be able to, to get a, a, a decent temperature. I'm not going to go through these in detail. I'll put these up here more as a, if anyone's interested uh, for, for memory. So this is just saying that we've worked out that you need to have an animal to be 10 pixels big before you get a reliable te temperature measurement. This is showing why we got pretty worried because this is what happens when you stare at a single source. So on this axis here, this is time and this is temperature that you measure when looking at a source of a fixed temperature. <laughs> so yeah, that's a bit worrying. Uh, so it, well, it turns out that actually so what we learned from this is that you've got to leave the detector to warm up because it, it, the electronics turn on so the camera heats up, you're trying to measure temperature. So it's, but even then there's, and these regular repeating things is it's trying to calibrate itself but the way it's done that, it's calibrated to work at hotter temperatures, so it's not optimized. These are the sorts of things we're working. So if you're interested in using thermal cameras off the shelf, I think we can probably help uh, develop the, uh, doing that. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so this is just a, a, a point here, is that when, once you've done your temperature measurements and you've calibrated it, so this is going back to that poaching footage, the students hiding in the, in the woods, is that you can use your software to pick out the humans, uh, you can mask everything else. This is a standard thing we do in astronomy. It's kind of, you, you work out what your background is, you subtract it, and you get their temperature. So this is three students in a, in a field, and you measure this is, um, as a function of time, so it's flying over, and you measure student A, B, and C. You measure their temperature, and you can build up a temperature profile. How hot are humans at 7 o'clock in the morning in Tanzania? And then you can use that to, for your machine learning and so on put some physics in there and say, right, well, if it's 40 degrees, it's probably not human. Otherwise, I've got a severe flu. Um, yeah, okay. So the next thing we've been working on is taking, as astronomers, we, we use very big telescopes and we develop uh, tools to help, right? Say you want to observe the moon. Uh, what's the best time to observe it? What kind of camera do you want to use? And so on. So we, we've got a good way of taking very complicated things and boiling them down to help people use that most effectively. So what we're trying to do is to help um, people who may not have a technical background in, in flying to know, right, if I want to detect rhino, do I fly at 100 meters or 50 meters? Do I point my camera down? Do I point it on the side? Um, right, if I change my camera, how does that improve? So obviously, the, the higher you fly, the more area you cover, but you might miss animals. So there's this trade-off in sensitivity and, and height and so on. So we're trying to help. If you're interested, if, if you're trying to do a survey, then we've got tools that may help you here. So we did, this is, uh, this is my whiteboard, which gets abused a lot, um, as you'll see. So we, we've done some very simple things. You, we, you can work out geometrically what the field of view is. Uh, so if you're looking straight down, you've got a, instead of a nice square, you've got a sort of weirdly shaped uh, projection on the ground, which affects, so you're much more likely to detect a rhino if it's here than if it's here, because it's a lot closer and the pixels are physically smaller scale on the ground. And not only that, but it turns out that the, because these cameras have very large field of view, the optics are difficult. So this is looking at a fixed temperature source, and this is the temperature measured across the field of view. And you can see it changes. The reason it's just that's to do with the optics of the camera. So if you're looking for something very hot, 
and it's in this corner here, you've, you're less sensitive to the temperature that's in the corner than you are in the center. That's easily correctable, but you need to characterize it. So uh, we can tell you, if you tell, you, tell us what camera it is, we'll tell you what the, the problem is with that and how you should vary your survey to, uh, to account for this. And this is all in a handy website that Claire Burke has put together with Andy Simons, where you can put in a bunch of things. I'll get to this later. You can put in your, where you're going to observe, and it'll tell you something about the expected temperature, the ground temperature, and so on as a function of time of day. So it'll tell you, don't go to South Africa and observe at midday because you're not going to detect the thing. But, uh, and you can put in your sort of camera you've got, and it'll work out and tell you things like what's your projected area, what your camera is, where your sensitivity things are. So that's uh, available for anyone to use. Okay, environment effects. So this is something that, so this is something that Claire Burke has been doing. And so she has this background. She was an astrophysicist and then became, she went to work for the Met Office and is um, really been things like, do we go observing at 12 o'clock midday in South Africa? She can tell us that's a very silly thing to do. So, Issues with the environment. These are things that we didn't think of before the project. So this is just that footage, and this is the, the poacher footage, but instead of going in the morning, this is what happens if you go midday and you see everything's heated up. So now if you use a, a simple thresholding algorithm, you pick up all these rocks and tree branches and things that are now glowing in the thermal infrared because they've had the sun on them, and your life is horrible, basically. So there's a whole bunch of these false objects that aren't, they're basically they're, they're a nuisance. We want to get rid of them somehow. And uh, so what we do is we understand, this is uh, why I didn't do art, um, is that everything emits in the thermal, and so you have to distinguish one object from another. That's clear, by the way. I did not do that. That's clear. And, yeah, I'll skip that. for. Uh, I'll show you that after it's filming. Uh, but other things, animals can... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip that. Yeah, so this is a very visual way of... of of showing that. So this is looking for the river Rhine rabbit. And if you do it at 7 o'clock in the morning, then you can see this is the four people that we're following, and the rabbit jumps out. Yay. Can anyone spot the four people in here? This is only two and a half hours later. I gave a game away because I put the hours out, but even, even when you know where they are. Yeah, there's still four people there. It kind of visually demonstrates that you're stuffed. Okay, so what we've been doing is to try and model this. So say you want to observe Rhino in Nepal, when's the best time? When should you go? What time of day should you go? What time of year should you go? So we've been using, uh, an, uh, the, the key thing here is ground temperature. So what we've been doing is we've been using this, uh, the MODIS satellite, which has been flying around the Earth, characterizing the surface temperature for a long time. And so let's say in Tanzania, so we, we, this is for the poachers, the, the um, poacher detection experiment. So that's where we were in Tanzania. And we can go to the MODIS satellite, and it will tell you as a function of uh, months of the year what the average the land surface temperature is. You can go and work out, do this for different times. Uh, this is all stuff that clears on. This is in that observing, that website I showed before. So if you're interested, you can go in and this will work it all out for you. So this is the so temperature is different times of day. So you can see uh, at 1.30, it's, this is a function of time of year. Uh, we went in March, and so this was the temp daily temperature. If we know humans are 21 degrees, that's what we showed before, then you're stuffed if you go after 10 o'clock. Right, so that's kind of a way to help you use this thermal, thermal technology. Okay, so the idea is we can then test that. We get rid of our humans. We can compare it. So the prediction is shown here, the forecast predictions here. And this was the temperature of the ground. So it seems to do, based on our data, our prediction is doing pretty well. OK, so this is a bit about rates of transfer. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, there's also an issue with things being in the way, leaves, trees, uh, vegetation. So this is a, a, cam uh, a giraffe not doing a very good job of hiding behind a tree. Can you see me? Um, but that is annoying if you zoom farther away, you're blocking out some of the light. So we have a, a paper which showing the effect of that, how you correct for it. So if this is what the actual image looks like and you're a bit away from it, then this is the resulting image and you've got to try and infer what this is from what you actually observe. So there's a way we've developed to help you do that. So eventually the idea is that we'll be able to blank out all this background stuff and leave you with your poachers. 
Okay, so then, this is where we've been working with our, I think for the next little bits are, are more for people interested in the neural networks and things. This is the sort of innovations that we're trying to put in place for, for those. So, one thing we'd, we'd done right from the start, and I think is fair to say across uh, sort of neural networks and people trying to detect things, is that each frame is independent. And that's a pain, right? As you've seen, we've got many, many frames of, uh, of Rhino. And in one frame, when you run your network, you might have a 50% chance it's a rhino. And then in the next frame, it's 50% chance it's a rhino. And in the next frame, it's 50% chance it's a rhino. But combining all those together, it's actually a very high chance that this is a rhino. So you're missing out on a heck of a lot of information if you don't do that. So the next things we've got, these are our colleagues from University of Liverpool, and what they're doing. So this is showing you here. This is the instantaneous field of view of the thermal camera. And this is going to make an ortho mosaic, a map of the area it's looked over. These are the objects that have been picked out. And these are showing that these are individual objects. These are, this is their trajectory. So if you're interested in how animals move, uh, you can get the trajectory. And these are the cutouts that get sent back eventually. So this is, this is not in real time. The idea is that these are the cutouts. Um, OK, so if, if this gets sent back and you're an expert, you think, yeah, that's a, a mother rhino and it's, uh, it's calf. Uh, so the point is that you can build up, you follow a single thing, and you improve your detection statistics. So this is what we're doing. So we build up a, a sort of mosaic of all these animals. And we can do the same thing for the poachers. So this is, again, this is the instantaneous field of view. This is a map of the area that's built up over time with independent things. And then you ping back geolocation here. That looks pretty uh, like a human. Here's its geolocation. Go and get him. Okay, so that's in place, and the idea is that we'll then fold that into this machine learning. Uh, so if you're interested in that, do come and talk to me. So then the actual machine learning itself. So there's several things. So Ross really is a, an expert on, so I, I'm fully admit, I, I, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, I ha ha happily put you in touch with, with Ross if you're interested in the technical details. But the sorts of things that we've been doing here, and I'll show you a, a movie next, is, is transfer learning. So if you want to know rhinos in the thermal infrared, a good place to start is actually rhinos in the, uh, to, to train data is rhinos in the, in the optical. Because they, in terms of morphology and things, so we can start um, with one transfer to the other. We're using, the, the biggest problem is labeling, to build it. So we, the, the video I'm going to show you now took Ross two days. It didn't take it two days from the computer, it took him two days to do cutouts of individual animals. Now that is painful, and it's only a, a short video. That is the fundamental bottleneck. So there's two things that we're, we're doing here. Um, so number one is citizen science. We've got a Galaxy Zoo, we're working on a Galaxy Zoo project. So we're taking all this data and we can send it out to uh, good citizens who are trying to help this problem and, and help us label the animals. And the other one is we're using, which I think is quite innovative, is, is to use the thermal, because we've got a thermal and optical camera. We use the thermal to say, hey, here's something interesting. We can cut that out and then we pick out the optical that you never would have seen with the naked eye and use it to train in the optical. And of course, optical cameras are a lot cheaper and used more broadly. So you can use the thermal to pick out the objects of interest and the labeling to train your optical networks. So that's something uh, new that I don't think really has been done before. And yeah, combining all these things together, this is a movie that Ross made. A few technical details here for those who are uh, aficionados. The point is that we went to a chimp enclosure at Chester Zoo, and it sped up a bit. That's why it's all a bit, a bit jerky. But this is the, the, the goal of what we're trying to do. So here are humans that come in and check the enclosure, throw out a bit of food. Here are some birds. I don't know what they're doing, dodging in the background. Um, so that was the problem. You see the temperature change there? That was the, the camera thing. And he, here they come. It's a fun guys. Yeah, they do a bunch of things. So it doesn't work perfectly. So you'll notice in particular where, uh, where there are many chimps together, this particular algorithm could be improved. But the point is that generally when you run this for a long time and if you do tracking to know where things are, you're going to get over time a very good estimate of what you've got in that, in that enclosure in terms of the chimps. Then you can begin monitoring them, tracking them. Is one sitting still? Is it depressed? Is uh, one you know, moving around a lot. Maybe that's some behavioural things you can learn there. Okay, so, yeah, good. Astrophysics, where do I come into this? Well, 
I actually don't, it's embarrassing, I don't really do much to other people doing actually the real stuff. But the sorts of things that astrophysicists in general can do is training, putting physics into the machine learning. Again, this is something which I think is, is maybe new or different, is that we know when you're flying over, so when we've got our geometry, we know the field of view, we find something in pixel XY, we measure its size 10 pixels, because we know the geometry, how, how high the drone is, we know how far that thing is away, we get a size. And if that size is two meters, it's probably not a riverine rabbit. So you can use that to fold in, and that is massively important because it helps cut down your, when you're trying to do automated searching, what object it could be, and, if, and the background subtraction I said before. So there's a lot of technical work going on to automating this. So taking, you've got a camera, you buy them from a company, but then how do you get that system fully developed so you take the output from the camera into your, you need to have some lightweight computing system that will do your detecting and identification, then you've got to have some way to get that back down to someone on the ground for an immediate response. So Josh and Owen are engineer uh, experts in this and are doing that. And the idea is eventually is, is to have smart flights. What do I mean by that? Well, so you fly over, you've got a 50% chance it's a rhino, even when you do your time tracking. So the drone's smart enough to go, well, if I go twice as low, I'm going to drastically improve my detection if this is a rhino. And then you go down, sends the image back, and sends the, 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 uh, the image back. Okay, so then finally, uh, just talk about, a bit about this web service. So this is very much work in progress. There's a prototype uh, out there. So the way this is currently working at the moment is that, so this is a, a website that Carl and, and Paul have developed where it only works for single images at the moment, but it'll be developed for movies, where you can upload a file. So you choose a file. So I just went, I clicked in Google, I clicked uh, Rhino, give me an image of a Rhino, and this is an image that came up. And so you give that to our, um, so there's a machine learning uh, sitting under the hood. You run it on and it tells you, you've got two Rhinos in your image. And you go, uh, and it's very confident too, look at that. In, in all seriousness, so, so it's telling you what it's doing. It's doing a very good job of telling you that there are rhinos in your footage, but it's not perfect. So there is something at the bottom. You can say, well, what's wrong with that? You're like, well, uh, there was actually two rhino on the right side of one. And the algorithm goes, ah, right, okay. So it flags that up for, um, for training. So someone can again relabel that. You go back, you can train your, your image again. So a, you find another image and you stick it in and it, the algorithm improves. Uh, incrementally, and the more people that put the data in, the better this will get, the more we can help ecologists. Okay, so then, so finally, I won't talk about this, but we are very open to working with people. We're working with uh, people who are, so search and rescue, so exactly the same things. We're working with people like the Royal National Lifeboat Institute in the UK, uh, and people that are trying to find, you know, walker lost in the mountain, or someone that went, a fisher, fisherman was, fishing and, and gone lost, you want to catch them as soon as possible uh, while they're still warm. Um, and also agriculture, I didn't show here, there's a, there's a lot we can do with animal health, um, telling in, in remote countries where the, there's flocks spread over large areas, where their animals are, are there any that are sick, so on and so forth. So we're working on that. Please come and chat to us if you think any of this is useful. And I'm going to stop there, ask for questions. But before doing so, say a massive thanks, first of all, to to Melvin for having you here and, and for you for being here and uh, all of my colleagues who were, are working on this and a special thanks to STFC for all the, the funding that they've given us. Thanks very much. <laughs> <coughs>
GPS on an animal, and, and they do for extremely, right. um, for things where, where you, like the last rhino, mm. to keep track of them. I mean, right. and so there's absolutely, so th this is not the panacea. This is not going to solve everything. We're not trying to claim that. There are different methods. And so that's exactly, I had a technical question when yeah. you when you're talking about rare animals. Yes. Uh, so when you have um, uh, such a weak signal, you have a rare animal. Yeah. Uh, then you, there is a risk to end up with a high false positive mm -hmm. rate yes. and a lot of uh, waste uh, of efforts. Yeah. So say your machine learning predicts that here there are potentially 100 of uh, rhinos, mm -hmm. but if you go to the jungle, there will be only one mm -hmm. true positive because okay. rhinos are so, so rare and there are maybe hippos which look like rhinos. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, maybe in astronomy you have a way to, to handle these rare events. When, when, when the signal is so weak that even small noise can bring a high positive, uh, high false positive rate. Yes. So in astronomy, so this is that's a really interesting and a good and very interesting question. So in astronomy, the problem is exactly right because Mars is out there and STFC aren't gonna give me money to go twice as close to Mars to observe it in higher resolution, okay? With a drone, you can fly lower. So what we do is we build our thermal fingerprints of the rhino, in this case. We ha we've surveyed the area so we know what the vegetation's like, what the ground temperature is. So we can do synthetic observations where we put our rhino in and we say, if we fly at 100 meters, we're gonna have 50 false positives. That's unacceptable. However, we would use our simulator again and we say, if we go down to 50 meters, well, I forget what I said before, but if, if you go lower, then we're only gonna have one or two false positives given what we know. So we can use a simulator, and, and I mean, it's a very valid question, and it won't be perfect, but uh, the, the case you picked is interesting because you, if it's something like a rhino with so few left, it's worth the effort to go out for five false positives for, now, probably annoying, but because it's so important that it's better to be very complete and have a few false positives than it is to miss this one. So, but, but this, again, so, the, our philosophy here is working, and, and it's going to be different for different situations. So we're really working with the organisations who say, right, this is our use case, this is what we need, and we try and use our tools to help help answer that. But I mean, it's a good point. Th these are exactly the sorts of things that you need to think about. Okay, we'll take a question from over there next, please. Yeah. So uh, you talk a lot about finding poachers and so forth. Yes. So I, I'm just curious. So many of these poachers are essentially extremists financing their extremism through poaching. So when you're out there, you're threatening their livelihood and in some cases, some countries, I guess, even their lives. So do you have any security measures when you're out there and doing so these things? It's a tragic statement is hundreds of rangers are killed every year. They are, that's, that's, that's a fact. And if we can reduce that number by sending a drone, if a drone gets shot down, that's actually good for us because no, I mean when you guys are out there and testing oh, things. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so, so us, us in particular. So we probably won't be going to places as dangerous as that to do the testing. I think that would be a bit foolhardy and reckless. So we tend to go to uh, places where they're in the wild, but there's you know the secure areas with with currently less poaching. We learn from that and then take that, give it to the rangers who who do a, a fantastic job, who are used to dealing with this. So again, we, we have to know our place. We're, we're not coming in and trying to solve everything. We're trying to give a solution to improve certain things. So in the case of, of poaching, if we can get rangers, they don't need to be physically with the rhinos, then that's gonna hopefully improve, improve what they're doing. So there are a whole bunch of other associated problems I've not talked about, like the one you've, you've highlighted, and we're not, we're, we're, there are people who understand that way better than we do. Right. Okay, we'll take a question from over here first, please. About five years ago, there was an elephant census in all of Africa. Yeah. And I think that was done mainly by fixed wing aircraft, yeah. the traditional way. Yeah. Now, <laughs> doing that with drones, it seems you would have problems with battery life and all sorts of things. Uh, and maybe a more promising way to go in, in, in large scale wildlife sensors would be satellites, uh, which can cover areas like 100 by 100 kilometers with a 30 centimeter resolution. Yes. Uh, so could, I would be interested to hear your opinion of the long-term prospects of these different methods for, for uh, wildlife sensors in, in the future, because they clearly have different yeah. 
work package and weaknesses sits in our project <laughs> is doing exactly that. So currently, so I'll, I'll just take a step back. And, so there's two things there. You had one specifically about the elephants, and you made a statement that drones, the battery life won't last. There are now, the, the drone technology is proceeding so fast, so quickly that 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 drones, there are now fixed wing drones that, are, that have solar panels yeah. that can just go. So you send them up, they go, they can fly an awful lot lower than for safety reasons. Uh, so one of the dangers, so a, a, an expensive but more direct method of counting is using aircraft. Uh, aren't you limited to some altitude by, by uh, uh, aviation Yes, but it's a sure rules? sight lower than, than for aircraft. So, so you, you can fly a yeah, hundred, two hundred meters, or what oh, is no, it? Oh no, 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 no! You can fly much lower than that. Yeah, but but you cannot fly higher, can you? Um, so yeah, so th there are there are certain heights that it's country specific. So that yeah, there's there's okay. definitely a height issue, um, which, but I, I would argue that if if you can stay up for as long as you want, you want to be lower for better resolution. But this is this is the sort of thing that our observing calculator would tell us. So there's I think there's a, a discussion on planes versus, so manned aircraft versus non-manned aircraft. So that's an interesting one. It will be use case specific. Um, if you're interested in an elephant, for example, because they're so big, maybe it makes sense to use a plane because they're fast and so on. So the, the second part of your question was to do with satellites. So one of the things that we're, we're doing is we are working, we're waiting till this MODIS satellite comes over or thermal satellites come over. We're trying to fly over at the same time to get high resolution thermal images at the same time as the lower uh, resolution satellite images. And then we can see what, we know what the ground truth is and we can see what we can detect here. Now the problem currently with the thermal is the resolution is way worse in satellites than the optical. Um, but we're, we're, we're working on that. And in the future, that's exactly where we want to go. Drones are not the, the solution. In 10 years, it'll be satellites, but we've got to develop the technology now to be ready for that. Okay, got a question at the back. Um, hello. Um, so you spend a lot of efforts on calibrating the temperature, but in fact what you're measuring is this uh, optical power in microwatts or something in yes. infrared. And uh, different skins or furs or, mm. or feathers, they have different emissivity. Yes, yes. That's right. So, so you assume, you make several assumptions. You assume it's a black body, it's a vein distribution. Okay, so and then you've got a past as well. So this this is not perfect. The this will never be, you know, you're not going to get 0.1 degree accuracy. That's 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 never going to be the case for the reason. Also, because you're looking through the atmosphere, that changes your results. I didn't talk about that. So you're right. So there's there's a limit to how well you can do, but we can certainly do uh, tell the difference between something at 10 and 20 degrees, and and e even that in and of itself, if you can reliably do that and you trust it, that can help your machine learning. Can help to tell you what. If it's 40 degrees, it's probably not human. So at that kind of level, the absolute temperature is, is useful. But you're right, I mean, it's, it's never going to be, be as accurate as a thermometer. Okay, we had a question at the front, I think. Oh, hey. Hi, yes, I uh, really enjoyed this. Uh, was there any interest from the military in uh, this algorithm development? Um, uh, are you allowed to talk about it? I, uh, <laughs> I think the military are probably, they, they are so far ahead of, of where we are with this. Uh, that, that they are, you know, if they saw this, they'd probably laugh and say, we did this in the 60s. But, but, but this is, I mean, in, in, it's, it's a really good question because what we're actually using is ex-military equipment. So these thermal cameras, was a spin-off, the company we buy from was a spin-off company from the military that we're now using these cameras. So it's, the military link is absolutely there, but it's the other way around, I think. And are you, um, drones are very noisy. Are you worried about them scaring away animals, but more especially poachers? It's, it's a, a serious, con well, if we scare away poachers, fantastic. If that's all it takes, then we're done. Let's just get loudspeakers everywhere and scare them away. Um, if, so they, they currently are, they're getting better, I will say. But one of the things that we have to do is, again, this is where the ecologists come in, is that we, uh, they are used to the behavioral thing. And so obviously we don't want to stress the animals. That's what we try and avoid. So that the sorts of things we have them there, there's certain things you can do. So animals tend to be much better in, in our experience. I don't know, if, I don't know if how widely this holds. Um, it's not my area of expertise. But if you fly a drone, even if it's a bit noisy, if you have it, so what we tend to do is we fly in grid patterns. And the animals don't really care about that. Like you fly in a grid, they kind of, they notice it, but if it's just in a, 
constant thing they don't tend to. For example, the spider monkeys may make, one of them may make a scream, which is a, hey, look, I think. Again, I, I, but, um, but then they don't. If you go and then you stop and you go down, they go bananas, because that's quite a, a thin thing. So using your knowledge of how they react in certain environments, and it may be different in one place where they're habituated to humans, somewhere else, all, all you can do is, you're trying to help these things, you try and keep that to a minimum, and you go to the experts, which can hopefully tell you. Okay, we had a question at the back again, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, in our department, we're also trying to uh, sort of look at the calibration of drones and satellite data. But ah, one of interesting. The yeah, uh, geography. Yeah. Uh, oh, but yeah, one, of course, one, yeah. one of the things that I have a question regarding uh, your presentation is like the modus data that you're using. Yeah. Like, um, we've used, uh, for example, the NDVI data, and that's a 16-day maybe uh, sort of the, the satellite coming around and the resolution at best 250 meters. So what do you have uh, for, like, the ground temperature, like, in terms of that resolution? The resolution is about a kilometer. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the problem with thermal, it's longer wavelength, so the diffraction limit means you've got a bigger... It's worse resolution. So it's about, for, for the, the satellite we're using, it's about a kilometre square. Oh, is this Sentinel? Uh, MODIS is the satellite. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, and one last question just in front of you there. Please <coughs> you stick your hand up so you can see. There's a question there. <coughs> so uh, is it feasible to implement this idea to sea life as well, if not too far into the ocean? probably near the coastal areas? So the problem is that water um, is opaque to thermal infrared radiation. So unfortunately, you can't see into the water. But what you can do, one of the, the cool, cool things we're doing is things like dolphins. So there's a, a very endangered, the, the Amazonian river dolphins. We're working with WWF in Brazil, and they go, come up above. And then you can catch them if they do that. But looking, using thermal, using the thermal technology, will not be good underwater. We can use the, the, the machine learning and, and things potentially could be of interest, um, but yeah, not, not uh, the thermal. Any other wavelengths, if not thermal? Um, possibly, I, I'm, not, I'm not really, it's a bit far from my, from my expertise, but, but yeah. Right, I think then if there are no more questions, then let's thank Steve one more time for a really excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.